Так. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
Thank you, Dale. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to call this meeting to order. We would like to recognize that collectively we are on the unceded territory of the Rowa Nation. Uh, I will um, open the floor for nominations for chair for PEVIS for 2023. I'll nominate uh, Mike Richmond. Thank you. Do you accept the nomination, Director Richmond? I do. Thank you. Thank you. I will um, call a second time for nominations. And I will call a third time for nominations. Thank you. Uh, Director Richmond is acclaimed as chair. And I will turn the chair over to Director Richmond for the vice chair election, please. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Uh, I'll open the floor to nominations for vice chair. And I can see everybody's hands except Jan. So anybody? I'd like to nominate Director Mack then. I'll second that. <laughs> and I accept. Okay, I'll open it up to any other nominations. And a third time for nominations for vice chair. Being none, uh, Director Mack is vice chair. And as first order of business, uh, as the chair, I'm thinking that seeing as I am on remote uh, and potentially disruptive, I'm, I'm wondering if it would be easiest for me to pass the chair for today's meeting to Director Mack. Um, that works okay with staff because I will be going on on call soon. So, so that said, Director Back, take the okay. meeting. <clears throat> Very good, thank you. Um, hello, everybody. So, um, could I have an approval of the agenda, please? Okay, move to second it. Call the question all in favor. Post motion carried. Thank you. Delegations. First delegation, three point one is Bree Thorlikson. And Nancy Lee, right on. Yes. So you got everything set up here? I think so. Are you playing my side slideshow? Okay. Yep. Let me know when it's. All right, thank you very much for having us. My name is Bree Thorlickson and this is Nancy Lee for, from the Pemberton Aquatic Cycling Association, um, or Porca for short, you'll hear us say Porca quite a bit. Okay, so next slide. Porca's mission is to support Pemberton's mountain biking culture by fostering the growth and sustainability of the trail network and to provide opportunities for all levels of mountain bikers. Our guiding values are inclusive, fun, and community. Next. Porca is grateful to operate on the unceded territory of the Little Lot Nation. Understanding and acknowledging the historical impacts of trails and recreation on First Nations communities is critical. Many parks and recreation areas have been created without the consent of Indigenous people and from which they have received little benefit. Porca is working to create an equitable, diverse, and inclusive mountain bike com community. To do this, we need to decolonize our brains, our systems, and work towards meaningful reconciliation. Porca recognizes that Lilwat Nation are the original land stewards of this area, and we share the value of respecting and caring for the land. Some of the things we've been doing in Porca's reconciliation journey include offer free membership to Lilwat Nation members, engage in regular communication with Lilwat Lands and Resources and the business group. All events and meetings start with land acknowledgement. We have been honored to host Maxine Bruce, Lois Joseph, and her daughter, who have shared stories, song, and dance at the Spud Crusher Women's Enduro. Partnering with Indigenous led organizations such as Indigenous Women Outdoors and Indigenous Life Sports Academy, providing recreational or sorry, providing educational resources on our website for members to learn about decolonization and reconciliation, and educating PORCA directors through Indigenous cultural awareness training within their first year on our board. Porca strives to maintain and enhance Pemberton's world-class riding experience for residents and visitors. All adult Porca members are required to contribute $20 towards a Pemberton Valley Trails Association membership, which has generated $13,000 for the PBTA this year alone. 
In September, Porco hosted the International Mountain Biking Association's Trail Building Workshop to teach sustainable building practices and to raise awareness on the impacts of unsanctioned trail building. We hosted five volunteer trail maintenance days, which included a women's night, a youth day with the Colo Community School, and collaborations with ORCBC, PBTA, and PBDA. Next. Advocacy for mountain bikers and trails are core to our mission. We do this work through building relationships with federal, provincial, local, regional, and First Nations governments, various stakeholders such as community organizations, private landowners, industry, and commercial operators. Our director of trails and executive director are on the Permanent Valley Trails Master Plan Working Group, and we drafted the committee terms of reference which ensures trail planning initiatives respects legal interests on the land, including Lilawat Nation Indigenous Rights and Title. Most recently, we have provided input to the Spilcompton Community Forest to help reduce harvesting impact on mountain bike trails, supported the CN Train Bridge Committee, and are members of IMBA and ORCBC who advocate nationwide for mountain biking. This year, Porca partnered with WildSafe BC to host a bear, bear aware workshop. We used our newsletter to share information from Sea to Sky Invasive Species and regularly encourage all mountain bikers to practice respectful and safe trail etiquette. Yes. Porca aims to strengthen community relationships by hosting events and programs. Events are an important part of fundraising to support our mission. In 2022, we hosted the Pemberton Enduro. This is an epic five-stage race that pushes the physical limits for even the professional riders that show up to take on the course. The event, oh, sorry, back one, sorry. Yeah. The event is capped at 150 racers and is a blind format to limit impact on the trails. This event, along with the next one, the Spud Crusher Enduro, are the two major fundraisers that support Porca, the PPTA, and other community organizations. So the Spud Crusher Women's Enduro was created for women in mountain biking and provides an inclusive, supportive, and fun environment. Our membership is 50% female, and our commitment to women-specific programming is part of the reason why. So the 30-Day Mountain Bike Challenge. This event is free, virtual, and was conceived during the pandemic. It continues to be a major membership driver for us. The goal is to ride a bike every day for 30 minutes, 30 days in a row. All ages, abilities, and modes of bicycle are accepted. It's an opportunity to combat those winter blues, get in shape, reduce carbon emissions, and boost those positive endorphins. Last year, we had 145 people participate. The PEM, next slide. The PEMB50 virtual challenge was born from the pandemic as well and continues to challenge people who love the suffer best. You can see by Will's face up there. The goal is to ride 50 kilometers of technical Pemberton single track in one day. The event runs over 10 days to spread out the impact of the trails. And it's a fundraising event that directly benefits community organizations such as the PBTA, Pemberton Search and Rescue, and Indigenous Women Outdoors. Next. Tuning races are more social than an actual race. It's about bringing people together to share a passion for bikes and a social post-ride app race. It costs $2 to participate and is supported by local businesses who set the course and provide food and beverage. We average around 40 to 50 riders per tuny. It's held on a Tuesday night in the evenings in the spring and the fall. We did seven tunies last year. Next. The Women's Bike Club Night has been around for a decade in Pemberton. It takes place Wednesday evenings and is a free program. This is a no pressure social bike ride followed by a self-supported app ride at different bike club members each week, bike club members house each week. Bike clubs help many new Pemberton residents feel a sense of community. Survey results have shown how meaningful bike club is for women to feel empowered, connected, and many have made lifelong friends. We averaged around 10 to 15 participants per ride, and we held 24 of them this past year. Although pre-pandemic, we could see as many as 60 women show up in the spring. Next. But Porca can't do this all alone. We partner with other community organizations that help us achieve our mission and uphold our values. This year, Porca events have raised funds for the PBTA, an extra $4,000, Permanent Search and Rescue, $4,000, and Indigenous Women Outdoors, 2500 
We also partnered with the Permanent District Chamber of Commerce to hold, host two events, the All Candidates Meeting, in which Corporate President Ian Kruger, MC, and Director of Community Engagement, Natalie Langman, organized. The annual Family Halloween Bike Ride and Barbecue was themed No Power, No prob Problem, because this year, Pemberton was scheduled to have an all-day power outage. The event was free to anyone in the community. The rain held off, and we had approximately 250 people attend. Next. We partnered with IMBA and ILSA to host Pemberton's Take a Kid Mountain Biking Day. This event was created to challenge adults to introduce kids to the sport of cycling. Two kids there. Next. We currently have 145 youth memberships under 18 years of age. Um, this year, the Parker Youth Program employed 15 coaches and a seasonal youth program manager. We hosted 24 youth skill development sessions in which 75 children participated. That is equivalent to 2,700 hours of childcare. We hosted 12 Girls on Wheels social rides for teens aged 13 to 18, supported by female Parker coaches as mentors. And we have youth categories in all of our events. There's just a couple of pictures of our after school program for Girls on Wheels and the amazing jerseys courtesy of a grant from the Whistler Black Home Foundation. Parker celebrated the grand opening of the Village of Pemberton's Mountain Bike Skills Park this past summer. Yes. Over 200 people attended the grand opening and riders of all ages and abilities enjoyed the asphalt pump track skills area and dirt jumps. This is a great addition to the mountain bike community and we look forward to seeing the skill progression of our local riders. Parker will be supporting the maintenance of the dirt jumps through fundraising and volunteer coordination. So why should Parker receive long-term funding from the Pemberton District Initiative Fund? So next. Pemberton and area are recognized as one of the best mountain bike destinations in the world. People not only want to visit here, they want to move here to live our lifestyle and our proximity to the mountains and trails it affords. Access to nature, trails, and recreational programming are crucial to the health and wellness of the residents living in our small rural community. Pemberton benefits economically by associations such as ours that support environmental, recreational, and social activities. Such initiatives benefit Pemberton's property developers, real estate agents, food and beverage outlets, retailers, grocers, combination providers, and of course, residents. All PETA funds are used to support the employment of our executive director, me, <laughs> and will help maintain and build the capacity of Corka and our impact to the residents of the village of Pemberton's Palmish Lilloa Regional District. Parker received $12,000 in 2022, and we are asking for the same level of funding under a five-year long-term funding agreement starting this next year. The executive director oversees Parker's operations and supports the volunteer board of directors with tasks that include, but certainly not limited to, administration and operations of programs, events, and special projects, membership, communications, and volunteer management, fundraising and financial management, advocating for mountain biking, and trails and Pemberton, community outreach and relationship building. Not receiving funds through PDF would mean that the executive director's hours would have to be scaled back to avoid an operational deficit. This could mean a reduction to the events and programs Parker is able to operate and ultimately impair our advocacy, trails and stewardship, education, equity, diversity, and inclusion work. Other measures that would be explored would be an increase to membership fees, as well as event and program registration fees, which could create barriers of entry to marginalized groups, such as low-income households. So thank you for the opportunity to present to you today and considering Parker for long-term funding on behalf of our volunteer board of directors. Thank you. And if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? I have a question. Do you have um, some kind of a training program with, uh, it's just come back to me through the community that um, some very, you know, gung-ho mountain bikers, and of course it's a, some of the trails are multi-use. Yeah. And some of our seniors mm -hmm. in the area have been almost ran over and told to off and that sort of thing. So I'm wondering if there is a training 
system that you have for trail usage and just general politeness? Yeah, there's um, the PBTA actually had had just put out a really good trail, like oh, what's it called? Etiquette. etiquette, trail etiquette sort of graph. And most mountain bike associations have something like that on their website. So it's something we we're hoping to put onto our website this year. I just don't have somebody doing our website, but we do put that through our social media media channels every single year. So, yeah. That's good. Or, or even just before you start an event or something, somebody do a little chat or. Oh, we do. We, we talk about that sort of thing. Yeah. Safe recreation all the time. In yeah. Events, especially, especially when we're around one mile lake, we know how crowded that area can be. And so we really, when I'm doing our park use plans with the village of Pemberton, we always have a safety plan for, especially around the boardwalks and everything that are there. But of okay. course we can't control every single person that's on the bike, but we try to educate our members. Yeah. My other question is, and it's been also brought to us previously, is just the environmental impact of some of the road trails mm -hmm. that go in. Mm -hmm. And I know you can't stop somebody from putting a trail in somewhere in the middle of nowhere, but it does make an impact. You have sort of an environmental committee within your association to sort we of sit, help yeah, mitigate we, that. We sit on the trails working group with the trails master plan. Mm -hmm. So we work with Stewardship Pemberton, Pemberton Wildlife Association, all different levels of government to discuss those things. But that doesn't, we do our best to try to educate all our members. We have resources on our website. We hosted the International Mountain Bike Association to come up to teach sustainable building practices like this past September. So we've done so many things to try to help mitigate that. A lot of times it's working on relationships to help educate some of the people that are doing that and, and identify who they are in the community. But a lot of times it's just one single person out there and we don't even know who, who they are. But I wouldn't say that Pemberton has a huge problem with road trail building, but we would definitely want to make sure that is not continuing to happen or exploding like it, it has in other communities. Could I speak to that as well? Um, one of the things that I have suggested is that that be brought to the attention of the mountain biking club at the high school because I think sometimes some of these, you know, kids getting into it might think, oh, I'm just going to put one in my backyard sort of thing. So that's something too, that we could approach maybe as an organization, approach the mountain biking club and mm -hmm. ask them if they could help to educate, help to educate the, the kids as well. Yeah. Well, I think your organization brings a lot of people into town and, and helps um, the vibrancy economically and everything. Um, yeah, most people just mentioned to me is that they feel that the, the erosion factors and, and that sort of thing is some concern mm -hmm. to the community at large. So, yeah, we work with the PBTA with that. We don't have any contracted trail builders for Porca, so we work alongside the PBTA to try to have more sustainable building practices and repair some of the trails that need it. So we, we did five trail maintenance nights last year just on different trails that our events especially have impacted. So we go out there and try to make sure that we're not having, no mountain biker wants to impact the environment. They don't want to have those trails go away. So right. they want to take care of them. So it's mm -hmm. a culture of like caring for the land. I know from outside point of view, it might look like that, but they don't want those trails to not exist. So they will take care of them. They're out there all the time taking care of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you for your good work. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Laura? Um, it, I just had a question in terms of budget. So this, the, the funds that you're requesting, um, what percentage of your operational budget does that represent? I would, I think our budget for this next year is 121,000. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, and then I, just one other question, similarly in line in terms of um, environmental impacts. Um, and I understand that this may very well be done in conjunction with PVTA, but um, it, again, in terms of kind of environmental stewardship um, and, and the fact that 
you're reporting, you know, there, there's an increased use of trails and it sounds like there's an anticipated increased use of trails. So in terms of kind of waste management um, and are there, yeah, I guess what kind of policies are in place to, to handle that? Um, do you mean like at trailheads? Yeah, I guess I, I just, yeah, I, that would probably be a better way of looking at it. So I know we actually don't have like a, um, a agreement with the province for crown use of the trail, like trail maintenance. Um, a lot of the trails are actually don't actually have an official agreement. Like the PPTA doesn't even have an agreement over a lot of that. So a lot of the trailheads, like the one at the bottom of the Mackenzie FSR is, um, the responsibility of BC rock sites and trails or the ministry of the whoever does the end of that forestry road. I think it's BC rock sites and trails as well. So there is, I think tourism Pemberton put in a toilet in there. There is a toilet there now. And then I think that there's one scheduled up at the Mosquito Lake zone to go in as well. At the, the far end of the lake, there's one composting toilet up there as well. And then I think once the um, Village of Pemberton's Denda Park is more developed, there'll be services for bathrooms and, and water facilities there as well. Okay, thank you. Mike, go ahead. Just amazing work, Bree. Thanks you guys, really great stuff. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, is there anything else we need to know going forward here? Um, yep. Thanks, I can briefly pop up and um, say good morning um, to the committee. My name is Philippa Campbell. I'm project and research coordinator from the SLRD. I help to administer the Permanent District Initiative Fund program. Um, this, is, this is one of four delegations. Thank you very much for coming and presenting today. Um, each of the delegations, um, their funding requests are considered in item 6.3 on your agenda. Um, so uh, we'd look for the direction as to whether you want to go um, to that report and consider one by one, or if you want to look at that um, report as a whole um, after the delegation have been completed. Um, the report does contain a budget and um, has some, some information there about um, what our forecast looks like. So. Um, to the chair as to um, how you would like to. Yeah, I think what we'll do is we'll go through the four uh, presentations first, and then when we get to 6.3, we can discuss all the funding uh, requests okay. at that time. Thank you. Yeah, so please do be update, um, take um, advantage of the time with the um, delegations as they are with you for any questions that you might have. Um, in that report, each of the applications is laid out one by one, so you can see um, considerations for them. Um, and I'm here if there's any any questions at any time. Yeah, very good. And thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you for having us. Once again, you guys, everybody that does uh, this is doing a wonderful job for our community. So be proud of yourselves for sure. Appreciate the support. Thank you. Thank you guys. And um, Jessica McFarland is here from Eminem BMX. Um, at your direction. And you guys have a presentation. Correct. Uh, Gail in the corner is going to help put it up on the screen for you. Hi, thank you. Good morning. Time. How is everyone? Good. Good. Um, so when it starts, start. Start, okay. You maximize your time. Here we go. Okay, so um, the FOOs are, I believe, end of our 11th year. Um, so our purpose is to create a track that provides all levels of rider, the riders the freedom to have fun and explore and push boundaries. Um, you can go to the next page. So just kind of covering what our goals and our vision are um, is to bring families together. And it is really neat at the track if you've been to an event the whole family can participate. So there are parents riding, there are kids riding. This summer, we actually had one little kid start to ride, decide it was too scary, but made his dad ride because he wants to come and watch racing. So now his dad races and they come and watch and support his dad. So it's pretty cute. Um, and 
uh, our core values, our safety first, of course, um, doing our best to respect our neighbors and work within our community, deliver high quality events, improve rider development and coaching, increase female participation and nurture rider retention and have integrity and follow through with all of our supporters. You can head to the next page, thank you. So this year it was really great to be back and feel like we had what was a normal season. We were riding through trying to get um, over the last couple of years, just having um, practices when we could. And then last year we started to host a few events and this summer felt like we were back into it. We did have um, a large, a couple of large events, which was really nice. So we are part of a sanctioning body that spreads out across Canada and down into the United States. So if you are a BMX Canada member, you can race at any BMX Canada sanctioned track. So when we have the larger events, it's really fun because it draws in people from all over. So we'll get people that come up from the States, we'll have people from all over BC. And then what's neat is it does create a bit of a family because there are kids and families that have gotten to know each other and have built friendships and relationships in other communities from other tracks, which is really neat. So it's it's been neat to see this summer some of those people come back together who haven't been able to connect because we weren't able to travel like we were. So that's been neat to watch that interaction happen again. And um, we also host a Sea to Sky series. So there is a track in North Vancouver, Squamish, Whistler, as well as here. So we host a series so that brings out more riders and it's just another opportunity for kids to race against riders from other tracks and, and parents alike. There are some pretty funny um, competitions between, between parents, which is, it just adds to kind of the fun and the community of it. We did see an increase in our membership again from last summer into this year. This year we had a bit of a funny year in the sense of, I think weather was a big piece of it. It was really hot a few nights. So we saw, we saw some lower numbers on certain nights but our ridership was still the same. Um, our membership had increased and has, has gotten back to pretty close to what it was pre-COVID. So I think with people traveling and the heat, we see different families over the course of the summer, but it's just still nice to see that our, our numbers are coming, are coming back. The other piece is we've worked to have a, a loaner fleet of BMX bikes. So when Pemberton BMX first started, everyone was kind of in the same place. So they'd show up in their jeans and whatever bikes that you had. And it was, it was a, felt a little bit more, I think, initially inclusive because no, he didn't show up in everybody's in their race gear and, and their bikes. And it can feel a little bit intimidating for the first time. So when we first started, everyone was in the same place. So now it's up to us to create that inclusivity as we go along, as things look more serious when you show up and there's the kids in their helmets and their fancy bikes. So we're working to build a loaner bike fleet and have some full face helmets for kids that want to come out and try the sport so that they can then try the bikes and see what it feels like and feel like they can fit into that piece a little bit more. Cause I think, you know, when you're 10, it's nice to feel like you have the same bike as, as the kid next to you. So that's been great that we've been able to bring that. We added a couple this year. Um, the other um, great thing that's happened is we've just seen a lot of um, female riders have continued, and then we're slowly starting to see our, our adult ridership build back up again. Uh, the little, the tiny little ones are the cutest. They're that next generation that's coming up into racing. They're so fun to watch, and it's been really cool to see, to watch them and the friendships develop with um, which is cool. Uh, next slide, please. So we have 91 active members. Um, over the course of the season, we hosted 18 events. We have been able to shift to online registration, which has been great because that has really streamlined our registration process. Um, some nights in the past, we were finding that there'd be a huge lineup uh, of registration. And now that we have the online piece, a lot of people end up pre-registering. So it just speeds the process up, which means we race faster um, because we have to obviously finish registration before we can head into racing. We have, so there is, because we're part of um, BMX Canada, riders can qualify for provincial plates. They can qualify for national plates or standings. So at this point, we have six riders in the top 10 provincially. Um, in BC, which is amazing. Um, and as I spoke to the increase in half track riders, the little ones has been really neat. And then watching them start to practice going into the gate. Um, and that was so cute that they're big helmets on. 
<laughs> um, and they're really fun to watch. Um, maintenance, we've been able to keep up with the track. I think our only challenge so far has been weeds, but I think that's everyone's challenge at BMX tracks. But um, just the dirt and whatnot that we have, we have a really good core group of people doing maintenance. So we've been able to keep the track in, in really great shape, which is which is awesome. And we're just starting to build that next generation of volunteers, which is great to see as kids grow up and move on. Um, we need new riders and new families to come in. So we're slowly seeing that that new core group starting to build again. Kind of everything, you know, over the last couple of years, it was everything was kind of flipped upside down. So it's nice to see things starting to, to come back together. Uh, next one, please. So the um, provincial qualifier and the Sea to Sky series, as I mentioned earlier, it's really amazing to have those events at the track because it allows the riders to, in within our community, to race against other other riders and have a different level of competition. It's really fun to watch, so it brings the community out together. To see it also brings people into town, so it's supporting businesses within the community as well. And just exposing people to to Pemberton. The other piece of it, because it is a larger event, it's double points racing, so that draws out draws out even more riders. So having those bigger um, events is a really um, incredible thing for the for our track in itself, because it also shows newer riders what's possible um, and how fun it can be to be a part of of those larger events. Because you can end up some BMX families will travel all over on um, BC for various races, which is neat. So, and the comment that we always get is that our track is so much fun because I think we keep a really mellow, um, calm, happy vibe at the track and want everybody to feel welcome. And, and yes, there is a competitive nature, but really it's about showing up and having fun and enjoying the experience. So it's really nice. That that's one of the best compliments that we can get is how fun, how much fun it is for people to come visit our track. Uh, next, please. So we have hosted our AGM and elected our board members for 2023. So there is um, myself, Kevin Chartrand, Jeff Ihaxi, Tara Tagan, Melissa Ronan, Rob Zernhelt, and Jody Hallett. They have all been um, so incredible in how much they've committed to Pemberton BMX. Everyone is returning. Jody is new to the board but she actually runs the Whistler track, but they've been struggling to keep that track going in Whistler. So she's slid over into our board. So she's a great resource to have as well and support system within, within the track. So we're really excited to see, we just had our board meeting talking about what we have planned for next year and focusing on bringing back some more coaching. We can get some higher level coaches coming in to, um, into town, which is great because that always obviously boosts up our riders and it's exciting to to have people at a high level or some riders or racers that have competed at quite a high level that are now doing coaching. So that's really fun for the kids to see that. Uh, we have an upcoming BC track operators meeting in December. So that is all the tracks within BC get together every year and we just talk about our um, strengths, what we've struggled with, and then work together to build our our um, schedule for next season, but it's just a really good opportunity for us to all share where we're at and then work together and kind of get ideas of how we can move our track forward in the future. We plan to, like I said, have some more coaching. We're going to actually add some more practice nights in. So we've just been racing at this point with very few practice nights, but we're working on having some more practice dates, especially for the younger kids that want to like the little littles that want to try the gate and move into full track. It can be really intimidating on on those big race nights. So we're just working at different ways that we can we can grow our ridership we have so that they can thrive. We're looking at um, replacing some equipment for the year to come. We have plans for a spring fundraiser, which is nice because we haven't been able to do that. So we're excited about the things that we can that we can do and just really promoting BMX BMX um, within within the community. Uh, next slide, please. So I just want to say thank you for your support. Uh, there is a lot of back-end administrative work that goes into keeping the track running, um, and it tends to go on all year. Just when I think, okay, I probably have about a month without any BMX stuff, then there's something else. So it's really nice just to have that, that support and to be able to, um, to have that 
knowing that that's there because as we try to build up that administrative side and bring someone else in, it's just it helps that longevity of of having someone that knows what's going on behind the scenes and that you know that things are going to get taken care of. So and that side of things. So thank you so much for your support over the last five years. Um, BMX has been my kids have come in and out of BMX, but um, it's kind of my baby that I can't let go of. <laughs> um, but uh, it's just it is a really neat thing to be a part of and and watching the kids grow and the successes and some of my favorite moments this summer have been the kids that have been scared to try the gate and it's their first time and then they'll start back and then they roll in and then when they actually go through it like sometimes they're up there crying and they cry their whole way around and then by the end they're like I can do it and then they're that success piece of facing that fear um is have been some of my favorite favorite moments this summer and just the the community and the family that happens within BMX is is really cool because it is sport, but I think it's also it's also really important to have extended community and families. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any, any questions? questions? Comments? Any ears, Mike? I'd just like to say thank you very much. I can hear the little loudspeakers and oh, stuff yeah. when I'm out walking and everybody looks like they're having a wonderful time. And and yeah, the facility itself always looks pretty spiffy. And yeah, great job. Yeah, it's a really good team. Laura? You okay? Yeah, no, I'd just like to say uh, thank you very much. This, um, since I've been here, it's one of the organizations and one of the sports I've been aware of, and it seems like uh, there's a, a lot of community involvement. Thanks. Yeah, and I just, I think you guys have done an amazing job um, from how, where you started from yeah. and where you are today is absolutely amazing. And uh, yeah, I just, I think it's just a great thing for our community and for the kids and families, like you say. So yeah, good for you. Keep going. Perfect. We plan to. <laughs> Let your baby grow up. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Any other questions? No, okay. I don't see any. All right. Okay. Thank you for your time. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you very much. So now we go to 3.3. 3. Uh, Shelly Milstein. Somebody was joining us remotely. Good morning, Shelly. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, very really good. Thank you. Right on. Thanks for having me. Are we uh, just jumping right in? Yeah, we're live. All right. Okay. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, nice to see you. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person, but I came down with a terrible cold and I don't want to share my germs with you. So um, I'm here to present uh, on our application for the Whistler Adaptive Sports Program and our Pemberton community-based programs. Uh, my name is Shelley Milstein. I am the new executive director of the Whistler Adaptive Sports Program. Um, some of you may be familiar with Chelsea Walker, who has been with the organization for many years. She has uh, recently left for Invictus, and I am uh, here to take on the, the program. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little bit about our program. Uh, for over 20 years, the Whistler Adaptive Sports Program has been removing barriers to adventure for people with disabilities and neuro neurodiversity, offering a full range of adaptive sports programs and a dynamic learning center in Whistler. We provide over 3,000 lessons a year and 18 different programs to locals from BC and visitors from across Canada and from around the world. Next slide. 
So our application is focused on our adaptive sports community-based multi-sport program. So through this program, we provide year-round sports, therapeutic programming, and rec recreational opportunities to local families living in Squamish, Whistler, and Pemberton. We serve participants with a wide range of disabilities. These might include Down syndrome, fetal alcohol syndrome disorder, autism, brain injury, spinal cord injury. Uh, increasingly, we're also serving older adults that are losing mobility as they age. Currently, we have around 15 active part uh, participants in Pemberton, and as the community grows, we anticipate that we'll have uh, many more in the next five years. Next slide. So our program goals are to help our athletes, our participants, develop physical literacy skills that will help them participate in regular exercise, participate in activities with their peers, and also engage with the outdoors, and to promote health and wellness into adulthood. For any of you who don't like jargon or like uh, specific definitions, physical literacy is the motivation, confidence, physical competence, knowledge, and understanding to value and take responsibility for engagement in physical activities for life. Basically, we want to give people the tools and skills so that they'll be able to maintain their health and wellness well into adulthood. Next slide, please. So some of our um, goals and outcomes include increasing the independence and self-confidence of people living with disabilities. Also, we want to provide quality opportunities for people with disabilities to be able to participate in sport. We want to increase the physical literacy as people with, of people with disabilities, and we want to provide those with physical disabilities a chance to connect with nature and with outdoor spaces. And of course, the end goal is that we want to reduce chronic illnesses that are very common in uh, the disability community, including poor mental health, diabetes, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. So what do we do? So our program activities, we currently offer uh, weekly lessons and activities. And right now we're offering those in Squamish, in Whistler, and in Pemberton. Um, a lot of our Pemberton residents, uh, they visit Whistler because obviously we don't have a pool here in Pemberton, things like that. So there's a lot of sort of back and forth, but we do also offer programs here in Pemberton. For winter, we include um, activities like alpine skiing, snowboard. You're probably familiar with our partnership with, uh, with Vail, with Whistler Blackcomb. That program uh, primarily services our international people that come to ski. Um, and then we have also our community-based local programs, which uh, also offers regular ski and snowboard lessons, as well as Nordic and snowshoeing to our local community here. In the spring and summer, you can see us at One Mile Lake. We are doing uh, kayaking, canoeing, swimming, biking, uh, hiking, and, and kids camp. This year we had uh, every Wednesday, we had a one day a week um, kids camp at Wamau Lake, and that was really well received by Pemberton uh, residents. Year round, we do swimming lessons in Whistler. We do yoga, strength and conditioning, and active play. We really want to make sure that our athletes uh, have access to the regular, regular exercise and physical activity, no matter uh, what it's doing outside. That's really important to us and it's really important to the families as well. So as I mentioned before, the activities are run in Pemberton and also in Whistler for Pemberton residents. Uh, next slide. So our request is uh, we're looking for some long term program funding at uh, we're asking for $12,000 a year over five years. This will really help with the sustainability of our program in Pemberton, and it also helps with our administrative burden and overhead, you know, rather than having to reapply and reapply and reapply every year. Um, we really need to, to seek out some funding that will give our program some sustainability so parents and families can be sure that next season or next year, our program is still going to be there and available for those kids. Uh, next slide. So um, our budget for servicing Pemberton residents is approximately $65,000. Um, you can see here and in the application that our, our fundraising comes from a variety of sources. Um, our Pemberton Legion fundraiser, which has been going for many years, and just some of the other uh, funding agreements that we have and, and our ongoing fundraising. Uh, next slide, please. And our expenses um, include our athletes and coaches, any equipment that we buy, of course, insurance, training for volunteers and staff, a um, uh, whole bunch of different things. Next slide. In terms of recognition, we would be happy to recognize 
the Pemberton Valley Utilities and Services Committee, however you deem fit, but we would offer up our annual report. Certainly we can recognize your support on social media and through our athlete newsletter. Next slide, please. Uh, that wraps up my, my program. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to learn about our program and to let me speak. And I've just included here um, some quotes from uh, one of the Peverton residents that participates in our programs. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for that. Uh, any questions from anybody? Mike, can you hear this okay? Mike's on the phone, so uh, okay. maybe having trouble talking. But anyways, um, I would just like to say thank you very much. Um, I think this is a wonderful program. Uh, it just makes everybody inclusive and everybody's involved in sports that everybody can enjoy. So, yeah, that, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, and uh, I guess just keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, my question, Shelly, is um, I sort of missed that part, or if you could go over it again, if you don't mind, is how many Pemberton folks? 15. 15 altogether, right? 15 is what we have right now. Some people come and go, um, but we are seeing a, a real increase in demand for our programs. Mm hmm yeah. Well, thank you for the good work you do. And yeah, I think it's marvelous. Thanks. Do you have anything, Laura? Yes, I just wanted to say thank you very much for the work you do. Um, the services and support you provide are incredibly important for the community. Um, and I know that families often lack the support they need and your, your, your programs offer um, this is the services and support that are so often missing. Thanks. Thank you very much. So that's the end of your uh, presentation. That's so, it. If there's no more questions, I'll jump off. Okay. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks, Thanks everyone. You know, 3.4 James Linkladder and Robbie Stevens from Pemberton Youth Soccer Association. Good morning, Robbie. Good morning, how are you? Thank you. Excellent. Good morning, James. Good morning, Russell, how are you? Very good, thanks. Awesome. Are you guys, you're ready to go? We're ready to go if you are. You bet we are. Awesome. Okay. Is this, uh, I can't see how many other participants there are, but I'll uh, just first off say good morning uh, to chair, other committee members and staff. I um, want to thank Peavis for the opportunity for this application. Um, and also want to recognize or acknowledge that uh, PYSA is is very thankful and appreciative of being kind of the first uh, benefactor of the Dendoff Recreation Facility, um, and that's primarily what our application about is about today. Um, we pride ourselves on being, if not the largest, one of the largest community groups in the area, including Area C and Lowat Nation, and uh, we pride ourselves on being really a, a available, accessible, and affordable, um, which is also part of the reason for our ask today. Um, I think the last time we came to Peebus was eight or 10 years ago around our uh, potato potato farmer irrigation system application at the Meadows Field. So, uh, you know, we're hopeful that we can just come once a decade uh, moving forward because otherwise we're essentially um, self-funded. Um, the ask, I don't know how many applications you have or what level of detail you've gone into, but our ask today is to uh, help us secure some new goals for the Dendoff facility. And we really believe it's gonna be a win-win-win, win for us as an organization, win for the community asset that is uh, outstanding out there. And we also believe it'll be a win for um, Village of Pemberton staff who maintain the facility. Um, part of the challenge we've had um, 
with the current setup is uh, the goals aren't compliant for our older groups from a level of competition. And now that we have the second field, um, we're trying to dip our toe into a higher level of competition. So these nets will help us do that. Um, there's also a safety and liability and morale um, component to this as well. We currently need to move the nets constantly um, to allow for the maintenance of the fields and, um, and off the field and securing them. So these new goals would have wheel kits as we call them which would allow for easier moving for both us as coaches, volunteers, and village staff. And then again, as I said earlier, kind of the opportunity to increase our competitive uh, programming and also um, the opportunity to host other clubs and organizations in our uh, awesome home field moving forward, whether it's growing league play or um, tournament play, um, is, is would really really be helpful here um if we're successful on the ask i think we'll be able to kind of keep our programming affordable and accessible as i mentioned if we're not um our main revenue stream for the club is uh registration fees and uh if if we need to go down that road that's uh though we're in a healthy fiscal position um it would certainly gut our um our savings and we would then potentially have to pass that cost on to our membership. Um, do you want some detail on the ask itself? Um, you can just, I think just the, uh, the amount, the total amount that you need to purchase this equipment. Right. So, um, Basically, and again, I don't know how much you saw in the application. We're we're totally open to being flexible and creative, and and uh, essentially a set of goals is going to cost anywhere between sixty five hundred to eight thousand dollars. Raw materials are constantly going up, and shipping, etc. Um, ideally, we'd like to get two sets of these goals for the um, the start of the fall twenty three season. And that's why I kind of speak to the creativity of the uh, the donors here as far as, uh, you know, the fiscal calendar or our operational calendar, because uh, there is a lead time between ordering and receiving. Um, so the ask would be, let me just go back to my uh, quote here. It'd be $30,000 over X amount of time, whether that's six months or a year. Um, and I, I did want to thank Village and SLRD staff for walking me through a little bit on the application itself. Um, we're not looking for seed funding or reduced funding over a, a long period of time. We're, we're kind of looking at a one shot or a two shot deal here. Um, if we could secure one set of goals for the spring and another one for the following fall, that would be um, ideal for us and really be able to maximize the second field um, improve morale, safety, li uh, liability for that uh, that site moving forward. Okay, hey, thank you very much for that uh, information. Um, so, really, what you guys are you you just need two sets of goal posts assemblies for the two fields. Yeah, it'd be primarily for the second field at Dendorf. Okay. Um, our, our existing, because then it would allow us to play two games simultaneously. Right now, we have to kind of go back to back to back sort of thing, um, yeah. which isn't the most efficient for traveling teams or, or us. Um, so again, it would be a, it would be great if we could achieve that to be able to have that critical mass on at the facility. Okay, so. Um... I'll just ask if there's any questions from the rest of the uh, committee. I'll go with Laura first. Uh, no, no questions here. Okay, thank you. Um, Is that a question, Russell? Yeah, just. Uh, no, I. Oh, yeah, just saying. Um, Mike, can you? Uh, is he uh, hearing us on the phone? I guess it's hard for him to relay anything back. Yeah, if, I think he knows to press star six to unmute himself. Um, but okay, Jan, go ahead. Hi, James. Jan, 
Oh, there he is. Oh, hey. He's here. Hi, Jen. How are you? Hi, guys. Yeah, no, I've heard everything. I just couldn't unmute until just recently. So, I mean, I've heard everything uh, from from what I understand. Uh, there's a potential for, for splitting this ask into two years. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm here. I'll hold comments for now. I'm just listening to the rest of the committee. Thanks for the presentation, though, James. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Jen? James, I just just am wondering overall how how big is the organization and how much usage is up there out there at the Demdoff Park? Well, right now, uh, as of kind of the fall, we'd cracked 200 members. So between the ages of four and say 14. And we're also, you know, part of a, we're really hoping we can start to grow the program into the older age groups as well with the, with the improved facility and the, and the field size, as well as the gold size. Um, I also, sorry, I forgot to uh, acknowledge or introduce you guys to our president, Robbie Stevens, who's on the call as well. I don't know if you guys spoke as well. He's uh, not only the president, but a, a coach of our U11 group. But um, I would say right now our programming, and Robbie, you can correct me if I'm uh, in error there, we'd be nudging about 20 hours a week for the, the spring season, which is April to end of June, and then again, um, September to uh, Halloween, essentially. Did one more question, Jen. Do you, Jen. do you work with the schools? as well with the whole their soccer program intertwined or is it all one or not not formally but i know pss is would love to host a tournament out at that facility and again with these new goals that would really help that yeah robbie go ahead yeah russell and i was just going to add jen just to add a little bit more uh holistic view obviously um this year we we begun sharing uh, the facility with uh, Alphonse and the Lowat crew as well. They used it a fair bit during the summertime, um, and we've been uh, we've been great partners in the region. But um, I would say that Lowat Soccer and Alphonse would also be benefactors of this, even though the the we sort of run the equipment uh, at the facility right now. But we're certainly very open and uh, and. Uh, sharing with everything that we have out there for them so that they have full use of the facility when needed. Very good. Thank you. Yes. Okay, the only thing that I will throw in here to both of you guys is um, it seems that you want uh, and it's beneficial to have both sets of these goal assemblies ready for the spring or the fall is it well ideally for next fall but we could take advantage uh you know if we could get one set for the spring season and then the second set for the fall season then we'd be golden for what what um what we entered this past fall season was called the interlock league so it's a north shore uh, soccer league that extends from uh, north van to us so when uh to address jan's comment i think the opportunity for more programming um would be realized on that as well okay um so once we get further in here and discuss the numbers um what i would suggest is um for you one of you to be in touch with me because uh, what i would like to see is i'd like to see you order both sets at the same time because uh with supply issues and pricing and all that kind of stuff if you get one for the fall or spring, which you probably have to order right now, um, then you wait. The next set might cost more. They might be delayed, whatever. Um, so what I'm going to say is we'll check our finances here with this fund. But I I would uh, I would ask one of you uh, to send a request to Area C. Um, either select funds or amenity funds okay. to cover the shortfall that whatever you need. So you can order both at the same time. Okay. Okay. And, yeah, and our suppliers, we'll talk about that after. Right? Yeah. And our suppliers are, you know, are uh, familiar with the situation and the ask and the timing. Um, so I'm, I'm really um, going to push for them to be creative 
um, as well around, you know, billing, if we can only receive, you know, one set of nets for March or April, and then the other one in September based on, you know, again, supply chain issues or delivery or yeah. cost savings, um, certainly going to go down that road as well. Okay. Um, yeah. So anyways, um, we'll, we'll discuss the numbers that we are working with, like I say, and then, um, uh, we'll get that information to you and, you know, what, what we need to do for second steps. But uh, I get the other question I was going to ask, we, we have discussed uh, the challenges with the uh, the width of the gates that you're moving stuff in and out of. Yeah. Has that been dealt with or not? No, it hasn't, unfortunately, which, you know, again, that's why I kind of said the the win-win for village staff as well. It, it It's hard for them and it's hard for us. Um, even with these wheel kits, they, they, the only way the nets will fit through is sideways. Yeah. Um, and even that is a real stretch. Robbie can uh, attune to that personally, having moved them himself. Um, and we have met with village staff around that. Um, and at this stage, there wasn't budget to, to address that. But certainly that would be a, a secondary ask um, that will help all concerned for sure. Yeah. So, and based on, on that, um, just from the uh, <clears throat> safety aspect of people having to move them in and out and all that sort of stuff. Um, I will uh, bring it up with uh, Craig Dalton, my CAO, and, um, and Elizabeth, the village CAO. And, and if it's a shortfall of funding, once again, um, you know, we can, uh, we can figure that out because all you would have to do is uh, just move one side of the uh, the gate, like take that one post out, move it six feet, so that fence is gone. Put a, a bigger size half a gate in, and that would take care of it. You wouldn't have to change both sides. Uh, you just need more space so you can get in and out of there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Agreed. All right. Well, thank you for that, and thank you for your presentation. You guys, like, it's a wonderful organization, and it, I think it's a sport that, uh, you know, I played as a kid because my mom couldn't afford to buy me all the good hockey stuff at the time, and, uh, yeah, it's just uh, a great sport. And then with the World Cup going on right now, it's, yeah, I think it's going to get better and better in this country as time goes forward. Yeah. So, anyways, thank you very much for that, you guys, and... Uh, Make sure you keep in touch, James or Robbie. Yep, sure will. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. And uh, thanks for your consideration of this application. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks all. Yeah. See you guys. Bye. So I will move on to the consent agenda. Hey, uh, could I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Moved by Jan, seconded by Laura. Well, the question all in favor, opposed, motion carried. Thank you. Now, are business arising from the minutes? I don't believe there is any. Staff reports and other business. Squamish Low Regional District Chief Administrator Office. Sir, verbal update. Nothing, Chair. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Elizabeth. You guys are too easy. So now we go to 6.3. So Pip's going to bring us up to date on well, what we can and can't do. Thank you very much, Chef. Thank you. Back in here. Um, thank you. Good morning again. Um, so item 6.3 is a uh, staff report, which summarizes um, the applications received in the 2023 intake for the Pemberton District Initiative Fund. Um, so these are applications that will be paid out starting next year, um, pending your recommendation and board approval. Uh, so we have uh, two returning applicants. We have Polka and um, Pemberton BMX, who spoke today. Um, sorry, three, um, which includes uh, the Pemberton Animal Wellbeing Society. 
Uh, they were not able to make this meeting today. However, I have included their information in this report um, because there are a bunch of implications um, with their request. Um, so they are scheduled to present at the January 12th meeting, um, but uh, th that information is there for the committee's consideration as well. We do not expect a decision on that today. Um, so uh, the report includes a budget. Um, in that budget, we have put the current applications. Um, they've been plugged in to show the impact um, across um, the coming years. Um, several of them are going up to the five-year span. Um, I would like to draw attention to the committee that um, with the we have other applications that are current, um, and those um, uh, a few of those four, I believe, are ending next year. Um, and we also have a recommendation from the committee to work with two more um, applicants, the one-time applicants that you heard at the previous meeting, um, to look at long-term applications for them as well. So just in terms of what this fund is going to look like in the coming years, um, that's, that's the sort of state of play at the moment. Um, and there is, um, there is a note in that report that um, those policy maximums we are seeing um, organisations come in um, either at or above those policy maximums. And so that's something to keep in mind as, as we look to these coming years, um, more decisions within that range, um, we are going to start to see some, some challenges, particularly on the arts, culture and recreation stream, uh, which, is the only, but, which is the only stream that has seen requests so far this year, economic development. Um, we did not see any um, new applications for that. Um, we also have um, uh, a couple of items on the work plan, so I've included that there as well, um, so you can see uh, where that staff time is going. It goes into both the administration, and there are also other tasks that need to be done, um, some to do with um, the implement implementation of the fund, um, which have not been completed yet. Um, and there's also uh, new work comes in in projects. So we have the fee waiver request, um, which was we have a recommendation from the committee to go ahead and create that process. Uh, and that's another piece of work that's sitting on that work plan. So just so there's visibility to the committee about um, where that staff time goes as well. Uh, so each of the applications has been split out. Um, so you can see um, what the request is. And um, we have some um, resolutions um, provided for the committee um, and happy to um, speak to those um, individually, um, if you would like to sort of go through one by one. Uh, I believe that's all I have in terms of um, overall notes. So um, to yourself, Jill. Yes, um, I guess my question is, having read this, <clears throat> now, most of these applications are for long-term funding. So do we have, like we have enough money to in our budget for this year to um, to satisfy all the requests as presented. But going forward, um, so the, the maximum on that requisition that we get, is that based on, um, like how, that, how does that go up? Is that just based on assessments? So currently the requisition is set um, by the mill rate. So yeah. that is that is based on the on the on the um assessment. assessment. Yeah. Um and that was a decision we shifted to that this year um, from the maximum amount um, in, in the bylaw um, because it provided more space for, right. for, for funding. So the budget as it is is um utilizes this year's requisition moving forward because we can't. I, I can't, can't predict, project I, that. Anymore. I can't project that. And so, yeah. you know, obviously during your budgeting process, you are going to um, learn more about what that requisition is going to look like yeah. um, in the coming years. So, potentially, if assessments go down, then the amount that this fund gets goes down. I, yeah, I don't know how reliable that is. It's, I, I can't see anything ever going down around here. But anyways, maybe that's a good thing yeah. on one hand and not so good on the other. But um, we do have the funding to cover everything for this year, all the requests. We have, uh, and so just to clarify, um, these, these funds would start to be paid out next year, 2023. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, nothing will come out of the 2022 budget. Um, so yes, for next year, 
uh, we have funding to pay for all of the requests as they have come through. Um, and the budget has been created out to that five year period to say, yes, we have funding for all of those. However, what we cannot predict is what sort of requests we're going to get each year yeah. for that annual intake. Over we, and above. Over, yeah, over yeah. and above. Yeah. Um, and as I said, there are new organisations who will potentially be coming back with um, requests for 2024 onwards. Yeah. And the fund is also, um, th there is supposed to be funding left for one-time applications, which can come in at any point. Um, so I, I believe in the policy you were looking at trying to set aside about 10% of the fund for those one-time applications. Yeah. We haven't seen a lot, but um, if that's still the intention... But one could really affect it. That, that's right. That could really affect yeah. it. Or there could be no funding left because everything has gone out in those right. long-term applications. So, I mean, it is it is very... Um, particularly the arts, culture and recreation stream is a very um, well-utilised stream of the fund. Um, and so these are sort of some of the challenges of... of um, there, there are some unknowns that that, that we just can't, um, yeah. can't speak to, but doing our best in the staff report to say this could be an issue, particularly if um, there are decisions that are made to sort of go over the what is recommended, what is in the policy as a maximum, um, which has happened previously. The committee has made decisions to go over that. Um, so just um, just noting that that will increase the chances of the fund becoming challenged. Garrett. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, intuitively, the assessments are going to go up and that's going to create a little bit more space in the budget, which will probably manage next year. But maybe for the committee's sake, can staff just quickly explain what it would look like if we wanted, uh, what the process is, if we want to increase the requisition, just so everybody understands what that looks like? So uh, this would tend to be outside my wheelhouse. Um, may I ask for Kristen to step through that process? I think, sorry, I just need a moment to consider that one. Sorry, it's just so that, uh, you know, again, I feel like uh, intuitively there will be enough room for to, to accommodate all the requests again next year. Like you say, you never know what we're going to get for one time or new requests, but I don't, I'm not sure that everybody really understands what a requisition requisition increase looks like or how it happens. So I think you are already requisitioning at the maximum amount allowed under the bylaw. So you, you we've switched from the, ma the a maximum amount, which was I think fifty thousand dollars for economic development and seventy five thousand for arts, culture, and recreation stream. So we've moved away from that fixed amount to the mill rate, which is tied to the assessments. And I believe that is set in the bylaw for each of the funds. So if there was a requirement to change, if, if the requisition as currently laid out in the bylaw was not sufficient, then I believe it would be an amendment process to change the requisition. But I'm sorry, this is, um, this is more of a financial question and I don't have a clear... Um, Speak. Sorry, I see um, CAO. Hey, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not sure, uh, Kristen, if you can bring any detail to this, but um, in short, if you are at the max requisition, then it would um, it would take a bit of time to seek an increase to that requisition. Um, and uh, I, I wouldn't want to speak to the steps, the process today, because I'd have to refer to a reference, but it's not a simple, it's not something that the committee can do um, on its own simply. It's a bit of a process that takes a matter of months. Um, and I think I would just leave it at there for now. But it, it, if, if it would help the committee, we can certainly walk walk you through that um, process at the next meeting. Thanks, Craig. It's, it's just for this, again, um, that's what I wanted to get to, is the fact that it's a, a process that takes months and it's something that has to get committed to on a number of levels. So it's not something we deal with at the village in terms of this requisition increase or these ceilings that we're you know, having to manage in this way. So I just wanted basically for, for Laura's um, sake, because I think it might be new to her, just to understand the fact is if we want to increase this budget, it's not like we increase a regular budget. It requires uh, a whole number of steps, including going to the public for it and the ministry. So 
we don't. I, I don't want staff to have to go through all the work or, or take us through it now. It's mostly just to say, yeah, it's not a simple process. It takes a number of months. Okay, thanks for that, Mike. Um, where do we want to go with this then? I would say we go. With, I mean, with that understanding, again, we're clear for this year. We know we know yeah. what's coming a little bit. Uh, I would say we go through the funding applications one by one. Okay. Um, so the first one then that I have here, um, the first one will be, okay. yeah, I guess we're just doing the four that presented or the three that presented here today. Uh, so there were four that presented today. Yeah. Yes. Um, you may wish to, depending on your discussion, um, just look at the pause piece, um, specifically because as we're talking about that policy maximum, it is going to come up in a couple of the applications. Um, and um, just as an awareness piece that they, they have made a request that is over the policy maximum. All right. Again, if no, no decision is expected on that today, um, but important to present it with that budget. Um, so Pemberton Off-Road Cycling Association is the first one in the um, uh, in, in the report. That's where you would like to start. Okay, I guess then, do we need to do these? We need to do them one by one, Kristen? Okay. Okay, so the, the application summary then, number one, Pemberton Off-Road Cycling Association, uh, I would make the motion that we uh, approve the funding as requested. And that that is uh, it's a one time a one time funding request by the SOU board policy number funding of twelve thousand dollars per year for a five year term. Um, that would be long term funding. Yeah. So yes. We've got enough money for this for 2023. So if we approve the long term five years, we don't know for sure that we have that money then. Or, or we'll always have at least this much money that we have now. And then based on assessment, um, I would assume it's going to go up every year. So um we we do have we do have the money going forward to fund their request on a year to year basis, um, but not anymore. We have based on the app, the current applications um, and the applications that have come before you today. We have money in the fund to fund you know over that five year period. Okay, um, we just. That they're what the requests look like um, through the next year and the year after um, is unknown. We also have a change in requisition potentially um, for 2024, which will impact the fund levels. So um, to the best of the information that we have today, yep. um, we can fund this request. Okay, so based on that, then I'm going to uh, move that. We approve the funding as requested, option one. And that's for uh, Porca. Do I have a seconder second. for that? I'll second it. Okay. Uh, any questions, Laura? Mike? Nope, good. Okay. So I'll call a question. All in favor, opposed, oh. motion carried. Kristen. Kristen. Thanks. So was that, um, so that should be subject entering into long-term funding agreement? Right. Not one time. No. Uh, correct. Sorry, my apologies. There is no. um, a mistake in there. Yes, please. Um, long-term funding agreement. For five years. For five what years. it is. Okay. And this is to actually that it be recommended to the Squamish Hill Regional District Board that the following resolution be passed. Yes. So that's okay. Now we go off to the next one, which is application summary two, Pemberton BMX Society. 
I'll move that for the long term. Okay, and I'll second it. Chan's going to second it. Doesn't matter. So, and um, so this again should say long term yeah. funding agreement, not one term. And that would be recommended to the board. All right, okay. And now then we go off to application summary number three, Permanent Animal Well-Being Society, and they're going to present in January, correct? Correct. But uh, based on that, funding is available for long term as it is now? It has been put in at the amount that they have requested. Okay. Um, so in the notes for committee, um, we're using that to highlight um, if, if there are areas of an application which are uh, out of alignment with the policy. Yeah. Um, and so this one in particular is, um, it is okay. above uh, the policy maximum. Based on that, then I will move option one, approve the funding. Seconder. So, sorry, is this for? Um, pause. Are we, we're doing pause today? We were not anticipating a decision oh. on this today. We were going uh, we're gonna we're wait till. Wait till the presentation. Okay. Um, it, it's in this so that the budget impact yeah, can, can be um, i'm not reading the fine print he considered january okay so we'll just defer this one then to the january meeting okay so i'll move it you second it jan and um call a question of vote all in favor of both motion carried so we go on to um application summary number four whistler adaptive sports program society and um once again, I will uh, move that we approve uh, the funding as requested long term. And that would be recommended to the Exponential Regional District Board that the following resolution be passed. I'll Thank move it. Me. Mike seconds Thank it. You. Okay, any uh, questions or comments? Call the question all in favor, opposed, motion carried. And finally, application summary five, Permanent Youth Soccer Association. So for that, I would uh, move that we approve the funding as requested. And that's law, that's, this is only a one term or a, a one time ask. Again, I'm sorry, I, I've put an error into the um, into the first option there. It, this is um, this is actually a long-term funding request. Um, with permission, Chair, I'd like to just briefly speak to this one. Yep, go right ahead. Thank you. Um, so uh, this was reviewed with the organisation. Um, uh, as you can see in the the notes, the application there. Um, there are a couple of ways in which this application. Um, uh, comes up against the what is written in the policy for the fund, um, all, all of which were reviewed with the organisation. Um, you know, when an organisation contacts staff, we give them the policy. We we speak through some of the some of the items there as well. So, um, first one being this is this has been crafted as a two year request because a thirty thousand dollar one time request of the fund. Um, is $25,000 above the policy maximum for one-time requests. They're only for small projects of up to $5,000. Um, so a two-year splits it into a long-term agreement, um, which can potentially, which is $3,000 above the policy max for a long-term agreement. And I, I do need to make it very clear that the way that the fund is set up, those payments would be coming mid-2023 and mid-2024. So that does not align with the organization's desire to get everything in place by fall 2023. Um, um, it's, it's also a sort of a capital, a capital request. Um, mm -hmm. And they have noted in the application that they have not sort of um, identified other funding to support this at this time, which is also um, noted as a, a strong recommendation in the policy as well. So um, this is, uh, this is um, a, a good opportunity for the, the committee to, to speak um, or, or to discuss um, how, how they want to handle this because it is quite a large impact on, on the fund um, to have to have that 30,000 going over two years. And I, 
there is concern that it's not actually going to meet the requirements of the organisation um, as it will come through this program. So there are a couple of options there for the committee to consider. Yeah, so my my recommendation would be that we we fund the uh, the amount of money that lets them buy that one set of opos, and then they apply to um, Harry C amenity funds that program for the amount of the second set. So then that takes that away from this fund. Um, then they stay within their, their boundaries, so to speak. Because the thing is, um, in order to make this facility functional, you need two sets of goalposts. And, you know, there's no point in buying one set now, in my mind anyways, and then waiting two years to buy the next set. Because what are you going to do in the meantime? You can't, you can't play with one set of goalposts on two fields, right? So, anyways, that that's that would be my recommendation, um, and I don't know how I go about getting that implemented. But yeah, Laura, go ahead. I I was just wondering um, if that might then make this um, the second potential recommend or second option for the direction uh, of the. The vote that it basically it'd be ref, um, that we refer the proponent to staff to work with staff to come up with um, a viable so to rework the proposal so that it you know they can look other at other options you know applying to us for funding again um, as well as looking at other sources so that they can um, ideally get both sets of goalposts within their preferred timeline. Right, so then the option that we should be looking at here then is to do not approve the funding as presented and have them make a new funding request based on sort of what I just said or how they could go about it. Just, uh, Kristen? Yeah, so it would be a one-time yeah. one funding yeah, my, of up to 15000 yeah. for one set and then you would expect expect them to either to secure funding from another source. Yeah. I had asked Ms. Campbell whether there was a prohibition in the policy against stacking or um, going to multiple SLRD funds for the same project. I'm not sure if you have that on the tip of your... So um, in the policy, um, there is uh, a line that um, organization groups or entities already receiving annual recurring funding from the Village of Pemberton or the SLRD through programs or other funding contributions, they are ineligible. Um, so I, my read is that, that it, that's not necessarily the case that we're looking at here. Um, and um, there has been past decisions where capital projects have, have been pro pro provided some funding through PDIF, um, notwithstanding that particular line as well. So um, I, I'm not seeing anything there that um, creates an issue. I'm happy to take uh, other advice. Um, and I just would like to note that a one-time funding request of $15,000 is $10,000 above the policy maximum. So is it's only five? Yeah. But we could recommend to the board that we uh, we allow that one time request. Uh, we have a or our recommendation have, would be to do that. Yeah, we have wording notwithstanding the policy that um, can be included uh, to make sure that's visible. Yeah. Uh, Mike's just having the floor. Oh. Mike. Uh, thanks. Um, and you have just answered one of my questions. I just wanted to confirm that five thousand was the ceiling for one time. You just said yes, so that makes it a little bit problematic. But you guys are, are working through that. I mean, I support Laura's uh, Director Ramsden's suggestion to go to option two and have staff rework it uh, a little bit with the proponent, bearing in you know with with the direction from the committee that I, it sounds like we do want to find a way to 
support the full request. I think if we're going to send it back to staff, let's make sure that we're clear as to whether or not we're supporting the full request in some form or another, um, just so that they know what we're trying to work through. So, because that five thousand dollar limit does seem to pose a problem, so I don't know how that works. Uh, that probably didn't help any. Okay, um, Jan. Um, it was my understanding that the conversation with James that the one goal post was about eight grand, right? Like if we were to fund the one one right now, like coming out for 2023. And, um, but they still have a set of goal posts that they're using now, right? And they just go back and forth with them. That's my- yeah, they're not the right yeah. size. They're not, they're not perfect, but they still have a workable thing if they get this other one that we would like to fund, right? Yeah, I think the only problem- So there is a working solution in the short term if we fund- The further. problem is those goalposts that are there now are not regulation goalposts. Hmm. So yeah. you, you couldn't have, um, I guess, certain levels of soccer, you know, teams, whatever, right. playing is, with those goalposts. Because it wouldn't be a recognized uh, sanctioned event. Yeah, though, exactly. But, yeah, no, I understand that. But I'm just thinking for a workability to start their season, you know, it with what they have now and then get the new fancy goalpost. Laura, go ahead. Yeah, just, just to build on this, is I think there seems to be a consensus that we you know, we, we'd like to support them, them in this application, I guess. I, um, and this is partially based on, a, I don't have the history of the, with the organization, but when I look at this proposal, I, I understand that the gist of it and what they're wanting to do. And I think that's something that would be important to support, but at the same time, their application does, it, it not that it, it goes against, a number of facets of the policy um, that is in place. And I guess my, my concern is, is, you know, if we really should just kind of be referring that back to the, to the proponent to work with administration to, to come up with something that fits in line with either the two year policy or the, the one time, because I'm just concerned that, you know, supposedly we develop the policy was developed for certain purposes and if it's if it's running counter to policy on multiple different levels and we approve it there's you know the question of precedent um as well as or or suggest to us that we may need to revisit the policy at, at one point so um i think the brainstorming is great but i but i wonder too if that's something that um having the having the proponent do because it I mean, like it was stated in the the policy, they haven't they haven't had. It doesn't seem like they've um, had the ability or or potentially looked at other different sources of funding besides besides the SLRD. Kristen, thanks. I just wanted to see if Ms. Campbell is aware of any pressing timeline for the soccer club that like would putting this over, referring it back to staff cause any problems with their timeline that you're aware of? So um, thank you for the question. Um, as noted in the notes for this particular application, the fund timeline already does not meet the organization's timeline, which is the preference to get all four goals in place by fall 2023, is my understanding. Um, you know, the under the ask as it stands, mid-2023 is the earliest that a payment could be made to the club. Um, certainly they have, their time frame is fall 2023, so um, the fund itself is not um, structured in a way to, to meet their requirements. Um, certainly going back to staff will add a step in that. Um, you will note, however, in the staff report, uh, there is, um, for these applications that are before you today, 
um, there is several steps which include agreements, insurance, um, and so on before funding comes in. And that work is not expected to start until February of next year, um, just based on um, current workload and, and capacity. So um, there is potential for that to come back in a January meeting, still go to the board in January yeah. and, and still meet that timeline. Chair. Chair, Mike, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry if uh, I missed a, a little bit of what you said here and there, Piff, so I'm sorry if I'm saying something that goes against what you just explained. Um, but what I heard earlier is that Director Mack is, is willing to perhaps support with a portion of this request. So if that's the case, uh, maybe that the first portion of the request from PYSA can be handled by his amenity fund, which will then help PYSA make their timelines for ordering the first set. And then we could refer this back to staff, as Director Ramsden suggested, to work with the proponent on the second set. Or, or it buys us a little bit of time, in other words, if, uh, to see how we can make it fit our policy, to see if there's other funding options. Um, yeah, just to see how we can make this fit a little better, uh, as she said, so we're not brainstorming this here. But if Director Max willing to put some amenity funds towards that, that I think covers the, the time-sensitive portion of the request and allows us a little more time to work out the request, the, the rest. Does that make sense? Yes, and actually, I can speed that process up by using select funds because using amenity funds, it eventually has to go to the board for approval. So this could so be. So my suggestion uh, would be a motion, the motion as 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 suggested by Director Ramson to refer back to staff. In the meantime, Director Mack, you can work with staff and, and figure out how much or how you want to fund the first portion of the request. And then, again, staff can have a little bit more time to work through the rest of the application. Okay. Um, is that is that the motion that we're making? Well, again, I think the motion was already suggested to, okay. to refer back to staff. So, but this way, this gives a little direction to staff in the meantime, as opposed to just saying, hey, staff, go deal with this, go deal with it. But in the meantime, you're going to contribute something to, I don't want to repeat myself. <laughs> yeah. Do what I said. Great. I was going to say, I think we'd be good with the refer back to staff piece. Yeah. To just. Okay. And then. Does that uh, make sense to Pip? Is that good with you? Can that's, I just... that's the information you need. Thank you. Okay. So uh, moved and seconded. I'll call the question. All in favor, oppose, motion carried. And then I will speak with CEO Dalton about how we put the first part together. Okay. Very good. Thank you. So now that takes care of those. Now we're on to 6.4 is um, <clears throat> to request direction on a fee waiver request from the Pemberton District Initiative Fund. And this is coming from the Rotary Club of Pemberton. Come to speak to that. I can. Thank you, Chair. Um, so again, Philip Campbell, Project and Research Coordinator, um, helping with the Pemberton and District Initiative Fund. Uh, so we're bringing back um, a report as um, per committee direction. Um, and this is to consider a fee waiver request from the Pemberton Rotary Club. Um, this uh, fee waivers are required to, sorry, the funding for fee waivers are required to come out of the Pemberton and District Initiative Fund um, as per the um, Squamish Little Regional District, Pemberton and District Recreation Services Fees and Charges Bylaw. Uh, currently, we don't have a process um, to consider these fee waivers under Pemberton District Initiative Fund. We need to work that process up. Um, for the Pemberton Rotary, which is the first one that we've come had come through, we're looking to um, bring this to committee as a, um, a one-time request um, while staff are also working in parallel on a 
fee waiver request process, which will hopefully streamline this, um, any, any future requests. Uh, so um, I've worked with the Village of Pemberton staff um, to uh, look at the request to see what's available, um, and they've provided sort of the information and the cost uh, to cover um, the re rotary request for their Wednesday morning meetings and some storage in the garage, which is currently being provided at no additional cost. Um, as based on today, um, we have suggested this could come out of the Arts, Culture and Recreation Permanent District Initiative Fund stream. And um, the resolution, the recommendation in front of you is sort of just crafted to sort of to um, show the process, which would be um, at the end of 2023, the village uh, lets the NYD staff know uh, how much is required um, of the maximum amount that we're, we're asking um, to get authorization for. They may not use some weeks. Um, and then there is a transfer from um, from the fund to the village of Pemberton to cover those operating costs. Um, again, this is this is a one-time request. Um, our intention would be to have a, a, a process in place um, to handle these um, in a different manner. So we have tried to make sure that's clear that if there is a desire for them to continue using the the, the room um, in future years or other requests, um, that there'll, there'll there'll be a different application process for that. Very good, thank you. Questions, Mike? No, no, I'm good, thanks. Okay, uh, Laura? No, I'm good, thank you. Say, John, you're good? Yes, just what do they pay now for the, for the use of a meeting room? Here. Does it have that amount there or no? Yeah, here. I didn't, I missed that. 133120, that's for their storage at their- Oh yeah, space. per year. Yeah. So I believe the the historic the information previously is that there was an agreement that they could use a room and some storage, um, which um, wasn't necessarily documented. Um, obviously, COVID has come and um, had a couple of years where they weren't meeting, uh, and now they're coming back um, with this request. And and we have this process that we need to follow based on that bylaw. So right. um, this is this is. This is the cost of providing that room to them and the storage. Well, I'm all for waiving that fee, but if to do the different revenue stream as you were suggesting. So it would the organ just for clarity, the organization would not pay the fee. Um, right. That, yeah, that no, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I understand sorry. what you were saying, and I, and I think that's a good idea. So the uh the recommendation then would be to approve option one. Approve the waiver fee as presented. Moved. Seconded, Jen. Okay, so moved and seconded to call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. Now we go on to 6.5 request for decision. 2023 PIVAS Committee meeting calendar. Um, has everybody looked at the dates? Works for me. I could move it as presented unless staff wants to speak to it. Yep, no, I totally agree. So moved by uh, Director Richmond. I'll second it. So moved and second to call the question. All in favor, Pose motion carry. Thank you. Decision on late business. I don't believe we have any. Late business done. Director's notice of motion. None. Ken is moved to adjourn. Thanks, Mike. Have a safe drive. Thanks, everyone. Sorry for calling in. Have a great day. And good luck. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.